All right, welcome back, folks. Uh, Daniel Tut here with Unity Productions Foundation. Uh, I'm very happy to now welcome our keynote address for today's symposium, uh, Professor Michael Gomez, who is actually a longstanding advisor to our organization, having advised multiple films of Unity Productions Foundation, including uh, Prince Among Slaves, The True Story of Al Rahman Ibrahim Asori, uh, Professor Gomez is one of the foremost uh, experts in the history uh, of Africa. He is based currently at New York University, where he is the Silver Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. Um, he's also the founding director of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora from its inception in 2000 to 2007. He is the editor of the Cambridge Studies on the African Diaspora with Cambridge University Press, and he has chaired history departments at both NYU and Spelman College, and he served as president of UNESCO's International Scientific Committee, Committee for the Slave Route Project from 2009 to 2011. Professor Gomez is the author of, of several books uh, the first one is entitled Pragmatism in the Age of Jihad, the Pre-Colonial -pre State of Bundu, um, as well as Exchanging Our Country Marks, the Transformation of African Identities in the Colonial and Antebellum South, which was published by University of North Carolina Press. Um, Dr. Gomez is um, today going to be offering a keynote as part of the American Muslim Pathways Project, which uh, Professor Gomez is one of our key scholars uh, for this project. We're very grateful uh, to have him here with us to give a talk uh, followed by a Q&A. So bring your questions uh, for Professor Gomez on the, on the following title, Understanding the Historical Contexts of African Muslims in the Americas. All right. I want to thank Daniel for inviting me to present uh, this afternoon, and I'm going to be talking about the various contexts of African Muslims in, who would find themselves in the Americas from basically the 16th through the 19th centuries. Uh, I've uh, written on this topic uh, some time ago in a book entitled, uh, what was the name of that book? Uh, uh, Black Crescent, uh, the history of uh, African Muslims in the Americas. So I've covered some of this, but much of what I have to say this afternoon uh, comes from uh, a book uh, more recently published entitled African Dominion. And this is looking at the, um, the experience of uh, uh, West Africa, early medieval West Africa, and uh, it's a new theorization of the interrelation, interconnections uh, between uh, polity and religion and so forth. All right. So, um, you know, I was trained as a West Af West Af uh, with as a historian in West African history with a specialty in the role of Islam there. Uh, subsequently became interested in African diasporic history. So I do both. Yeah. And so what I thought I would do and got Daniel's permission, I obtained Daniel's permission to kind of relate my most recent work to this earlier period. So we'll see how that goes. All right, so so this, what you're looking at here is a, a photograph of the uh, mosque in Jinni, uh, which is in contemporary Mali. And uh, I want to begin with, uh, I want to situate um, everyone uh, uh, with a more contemporary map of West Africa. And I am going to be, if this cursor will appear for me. Ah, uh, this is not what I want, sorry. Yeah, so hopefully you can see the cursor. So I'm going to be talking about uh, this area basically to the west of Niger, uh, and to the south of the Sahara, to, south of the Sahara, to the north of the more forested areas to the south. So we I basically want to be talking about um, uh, the Western Sahel and Savannah, and 
So what I want to do is to talk about preliminarily uh, the circumstances out of which African Muslims were extracted um, during the period of the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah, so they're coming out of different political circumstances. They're coming out of different societies. They're coming out of um, uh, uh, different cultural formations. And they are coming into the Americas in different periods so that the uh, the the Muslims who are coming into what is now into Hispaniola in the 15th and 16th centuries, into what is now Haiti and Dominican Republic, uh, they are coming out of circumstances and polities that differ from those who come subsequently in the 18th century and in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, once we get into the 18th and the 19th century, the West African Sahel becomes more and more consumed, more and more involved uh, with uh, what some uh, West Africanists, Africanists refer to as the age of jihad. And this is where this map, this is a, uh, a, a French map, but it, what it represents is our developments which take place, the approximations of ter territorial expansions, yeah, uh, of different uh, West African polities, which tend to be related to one another, beginning in the beginning, uh, actually beginning at, at the end of the 17th century and moving into uh, the first third of the 19th century. This is a period in time in which the whole of West Africa, well, the whole of the West African Sahel is kind of consumed with one form of, with one uh, experience in reformed uh, to another, beginning in this area of Futajalon in what is now Guinea in the 1720s, and then, um, and then in the 17th, uh, uh, 70, 1760s and 70s uh, in Futajalon, this is in the middle Senegal Valley. Uh, then you will have developments which take place uh, in uh, this area here, Masina, which is in what is now contemporary uh, Mali. We have the the the, the grand uh, uh, experiment in uh, what is now northern Nigeria, the Sokoto, which results in the Sokoto Caliphate, 1804 to 1812. You then have uh, subsequent developments coming back into uh, Senegambia, led by Elijah Omar, uh, which uh, leads into the middle of the 19th century. It goes on and on with Catholic account. The point is that the Muslims who are coming into the Americas, and in particular those who wind up in Brazil, which will culminate in the uh, so-called Malay Revolt in 1835, are coming out of a, a specific kind of experience uh, in West Africa, which did not necessarily characterize uh, those experiences earlier on in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, that's the point that I'm trying to make. So that's a that's a very broad point, but it under it 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 undergirds my the, the point that I want to make here, and that is to say that notwithstanding uh, the particular period and the and the particular province out of which uh, people are are emerging. Uh, in the in the from the 16th through the uh, 19th century, uh, they all sort of go back, if you will. They all have a commonality, if you will, to an earlier period in in the history of Islam in West Africa. And here you have a map of this earlier period. Uh, and you have the, the iconic uh, uh, imperial formations of Ghana, which is this kind of purplish spherical um, representation, which is in, ex in existence from the, from the 4th into the 11th century. And then you have um, in this greenish uh, outline, 
um, the subsequent empire of Mali about which I'm going to talk, uh, which runs from the 13th into the uh, 16th centuries as a power, but is continuing on. Mali continues on in uh, truncated fashion well into the 18th century. And in fact, the Malay revolt is related, we think, to the term Malay in the Brazilian context would seem to be related to the Yoruba uh, uh, transliteration or translation or reconfiguration of the term Mali. And then uh, which which speaks to which speaks to the power in the in the Muslim West African imagination of this earlier period. And then you do have um, uh, in this kind of golden sphere uh, the subsequent empire of Songhai, uh, which actually Songhai as a city state. Uh, was centered on the on the town of Gao, which is still in existence. It actually antedates uh, the earlier uh, kingdom of Ghana, uh, but Gao will serve as the political center uh, of the of the Songhai Empire, which comes into existence uh, in the 15th century and lasts until 1591 and the defeat of Songhai by the Moroccans. So. I want to talk about this earlier period, because whether Muslims were from um, uh, what is now contemporary Mali or Senegambia, uh, they all were aware of this anterior history. That is to say that the, 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 the cultural import of, 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 of Timbuktu, and Jinni as sites of, of, of study and um, erudition, uh, as well as the grandeur and the, and, the, and the opulence, if you will, of the earlier Malian Empire, um, was something where at, were concepts and, 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 and ideas and um, uh, representations of an iconic period which travel over space and over centuries, such that the, 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 if we can uh, think of this as a kind of, you know, regional Dar al Islam in West Africa, you know, people all participated in this notion, okay, of this, of this earlier foundation for, uh, for Islam and, and the Muslim experience. Now, when we go back to Ghana, which, which once again is you know in power, is is in existence as a as a as as a kingdom uh, from the fourth into the eleventh centuries. What we have there is, for the most part, a non-Muslim uh, ruling elite within which there's a growing uh, Muslim demographic as a consequence of the trans-Saharan trade, uh, primarily in gold. Less to a lesser extent in human beings and so forth, yeah. But by the time we get to Mali, yeah, in the in the founding of Mali in 1235 by Sunjata, 1233, 1235 by Sunjata, here we're beginning to get into a different uh, notion of the of the place and purchase of Islam in West Africa, and it's really with so so that. You have, um, you know, a growing Muslim population in West Africa, right? Uh, from the uh, eighth century uh, on, but it's really with the founding of Mali in the thirteenth century that we see a Muslim polity in West Africa, and it's this heritage to which um, uh, the vast majority of West Africans. Uh, 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 make claim, and and the notion of Mali as a polity uh, to be not only to be revered but also to be emulated in some ways continues on to the present day. So I want to talk about this about this kind of foundational uh, moment 
uh, in the history of West Africa in in uh, in uh, uh, in um, in the history of of, uh, of Muslims in the in the in the region, and consequently the the ways in which this uh, uh, this earlier history informs these Muslims who are traveling into the, into the Americas. So I want to begin uh, with uh, this representation. Uh, this was a map, a very famous map, um, the Catalan Atlas. Uh, for, uh, uh, created in Mallorca, and this we think is an attempt to represent uh, Mansa Musa, who was uh, the emperor of of Mali from 1312 to 1337. And of course, he is best known for the pilgrimage, the Hajj that he makes. Yeah, between 1324 1326, and so when he returns from pilgrimage in 1326. He will establish the basis for uh, Malian dominion that could be defended ide ideologically as well as militarily. What is more, he returns not simply as the ruler of Mali, but he is now an international figure uh, because he has greatly strengthened uh, the bona fides of, of, of Mali, uh, strengthened the, its regional as well as trans-regional claims. Um, the peripheries of Malian rule will approach their limits under Mansa Musa, primarily identifiable by way of, of a border villages and, and uh, towns with rural areas between them infrequently experiencing an imperial presence, uh, save in times of exigency. To the north, um, so, so this Miani is theorized as thought to have been at least the earliest center or near the uh, earlier center of of early Man, uh, Mali, which was referred to as Mandan. And so to the north, and these are the critical areas, uh, Gao to the eastern buckle, uh, on the eastern uh, Niagara buckle, and Timbuktu um, a bit to the north of the western buckle of the, of the uh, Niagara River. Uh, so to the north lay Gao, an ancient uh, town experienced in commercial and, and commercial and uh, cultural trans, uh, transactions and with Tat Mecca. You can see Tat Mecca is, is to the north. I'm sorry that my cursor keeps disappearing. Tat Mecca here to the north. Um, and then Kukia to the south. Uh, so And then Timbuktu to the west. Timbuktu's incorporation into Mali represents the addition of even more routes of concourse, largely from the upper to the western buckle of the Middle Niger, linking old bustling markets such as Ja. You can see that Ja's represented on the map here to the west, northwest of Jenny, as well as Jenny, uh, from which caravans connected to Walata. Walata, you can see also um, uh, to the north in the West African Sahel um, on the southern fringe of the desert. And this, these were way stations, entrepots, uh, from which materials are moving from the south to the north, and from the north, the salt of the Tagaza salt mines are moving to the south. And here's, this is a, a Tagaza here to the north. Uh, I will just say that um, the salt mine here and the labor that went into, uh, into extracting uh, salt from the salt mine was very, was, was, was horrible. This was a horrendous, uh, uh, very, very demanding uh, uh, process of mining uh, salt uh, produced by enslaved. This was the work was done by enslaved people, and you know, from Tagaza we moved north to Sigilmasa and further on into the Mediterranean. So these products, these 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 commodities, are moving north and south, um, and. Uh, so when, when Mansa Musa returns from, from Hajj, he sets his sights on Gao. And he wants, so Gao was not, before he left, before he went on Hajj in 1324, neither Gao nor Timbuktu were part of the Malian sphere. But when he returns, he sets his sights on the uh, city-state of, of Gao and, um, he wants to do that because uh, it represents 
uh, this imperial restlessness. Uh, you know, Mali uh, uh, is widely recognized as 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 being very very uh, wealthy in terms of its gold production, and so uh, as a as a as a consequence, if you will, of this material base, uh, Mali is experiencing imperial restless, restlessness. It has the desire to control all commercial arteries connecting the Western Savannah with the Sahel. Um, it um, it wants to create a certain integrity of the Nile, of the Niger Valley, um, and uh, its populations are being the various populations in West Africa are being connected by way of these cultural symmetries and economic relations. So in season Gao, uh, uh, Mansa Musa is realizing a breathtaking political vision. He is seeking to unify the Niger, Senegal, and Gambia Valley. So you have the Niger River, you have the Senegal River here, and you have the Gambia River here. So what Mansa Musa achieves is um, the creation of a, of a political sphere that stretches from the Atlantic Ocean in the, in the West, all the way to the eastern buckle uh, of the Niger in the east, and from the and from the uh, from the Sahara to the north to the to the uh, forest region in the south, uh, it's estimated that about forty to fifty million people uh, live in this area, with the Niger Valley as as the realm's core. <clears throat> and so here we see uh, a visual representation. Of 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 what Mansa Musa is able to is able to achieve, and so you can see that that um, uh, he unites the three river rain systems uh, uh, in such a way that he is able to capture and control all all commerce moving uh, north into the Sahara to into the Sahara and south moving into into the Sahel. One of the sources for uh, early Malian, Malian history is a document known as Tariq as Sudan, History of the Blacks. And it suggests that Gao's uh, submission to Mansa Musa uh, in 1326 was peaceful. No doubt a practical choice with Gao facing a superior military force, but it's not uh, to military might alone that Gao acquiesced but also to this newfound spiritual authority that Mansa Musa wields uh, when he returns uh, from pilgrimage. And so uh, with the submission of Gao, he will build a mosque uh, with a, a prayer niche, uh, mihrab, uh, on the outskirts of, of, of Gao, uh, uh, where he observes uh, Friday prayer. Uh, Tariq al-Fatash, which is a which is which is uh, another document, a major document for the history of medieval West Africa, uh, which translates literally into history of the seeker. Um, <clears throat> uh, distances distances itself from the lore. Uh, there was a notion that so the story in West Africa was that when Mansa Musa returns from pilgrimage, everywhere he goes, every town and every village into which um, he makes his presence known. He builds a mosque there. So this is hyperbole, but it connotes uh, a kind of larger truth that it is with Mansa Musa that we see the spread, expansion, and uh, the uh, and, and the uh, the uh, entrenchment, if you will, of, of Islam in West Africa. So. Uh, but Trik al Fatash does specify that there are six towns in which uh, uh, Mansa Musa actually builds uh, a mosque, and and so this this both the, so taking into consideration both the lore and the uh, and the empirical data, or or either or, uh, this this connotes uh, the crucial means by which the by which the Mansa justified and maintained uh, his authority. Uh, there may have been some questions about his right to rule in traditional Mali. Uh, and, and, and certainly there would have been questions insofar as whether in so with respect to whether he had the authority to rule over Timbuktu, because he he is a, a, a he is an outsider. He is not Songhai, which was the Songhai is a term that will come to represent uh, 
the state, the name of the state, but the, but the term Songhai or Songre or Songoy, these are all cognate terms, which also refer to an ethnicity. Uh, so in Gao, he's, he's definitely uh, an outsider, does not have the right to rule. But uh, uh, it's Islam that gives him the authority, right, to extend his political domination over a widening uh, expanse of, of, of territory. So uh, far more than war, Islam becomes the quintessential implement of dominion in this context. Mm. Uh, from Gao, the royal caravan returning from the Hajj proceeds to Timbuktu. And Timbuktu uh, is on this map. It's a dot. Uh, and it would be, uh, Timbuktu 2 would be here. And uh, Tariq Esadan says that uh, Mansa Musa becomes the first ruler to, quote, take possession of, of Timbuktu. Um, as was true of Gao, there are no hints of any hostility in Timbuktu. In Timbuktu. Indeed, um, the, uh, the, uh, the preeminent scholar, Ahmed Baba, uh, who lives from 1526 to 1627, and he's in exile in Morocco from 1593 to 1608, asserts that Timbuktu was sacked only three times in its history. So when Musa moves, comes into the, so the royal caravan is returning uh, from Hajj, uh, and there are thousands in, in his retinue. Uh, uh, on the basis of, of chronicles developed in, in Cairo, um, so there are thousands of people in his retinue, and he he enters Timbuktu, and there he will build uh, Jengarivir Mosque or the Great Mosque, um, and he uh, this is the this is a representation of uh, Jengarivir Mosque, uh, a very important mosque. It's kind of on the outskirts of what is now Timbuktu. I haven't been to Timbuktu since tw 2012 when the uh, when the troubles. Um, uh, form there about which we can talk or not. Uh, and he will, you know, add to it a tower. He will establish um, a personal residence nearby. Uh, and he will uh, create a Friday mosque uh, and so forth. And so what's happening in Timbuktu is that he is, he is creating a, a spatial representation of political power and spiritual power in Timbuktu, about which we'll have something uh, to say uh, subsequently. From the perspective, perspective of the internal uh, written record, that is in particular the Tawarik, uh, Timbuktu's rise progressively attracted merchants from all over the Muslim world, especially uh, Egypt, Misr, and, and, and El Maghreb, reaching a point at which they filled the city to, quote, overflowing. Timbuktu's emergence, on the other hand, uh, will bring about uh, the ruin of a town called Biro or Walata. I mentioned Walata before, and that's something about which, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time. Uh, um, the foregoing indicates that Islam and slavery were two aspects of an expansive medieval Mali, um, and uh, though both were present before the founder of Mali, Sunjata, the qualitative evidence strongly suggests that they grew as closely linked phenomena. Indirect testimony to Islam's gathering strength is, are the sources, is the source's virtual silence regarding mandate non-Muslim religions. We just don't know a lot about uh, these religions. <laughs> With much of what is known about them derived from later travel literature and ethnographic studies. When the external when the external Arabic sources, uh, what the when the external Arabic sources therefore present Mali as a Muslim realm, and it is the external sources that represent that present Mali, but uh, in the third in the um, in the in the fourteenth century as a Muslim polity as a Muslim real, realm, they are referring to conditions in urban areas, and uh, referring to the situation in the royal court where it was decidedly in the interest of, gov of government and expatriates to be considered part of the Muslim world. But the reality of religious practice was much more complicated. 
Given the foregoing, it is hardly surprising that Islam's development in Mali is best legible as a component of its political narrative. That Islam emerges as a powerful state-sanctioned force is discernible, discernible in imperial signage, constituting the site of its most compelling claim. Um, Mansa Musa's pilgrimage was undertaken on the advice of, of the ulama of, of, of Mali. Some of them were possibly non-West non -West African individuals. Um, with regard to the latter, their influence was only enhanced when Musa returns from, uh, from Egypt. He will be accompanied by the Grenadian or the Grenadian poet uh, Al Tuwajin. Uh, he will be accompanied by uh, um, Arab scholars from the Hejaz, uh, and he will be accompanied by unspecified experts in fiqh. Uh, the expatriate community was still a considerable presence during Ibn Battuta's visit in, in 1352. Uh, as earlier evidence and the example of Gauls Qadi, an individual by the name of uh, Abdul, uh, uh, Ab Abdullah Muhammad, who was from, from Sijil Masa, uh, expatriates were in, were in a, uh, represented a fair number uh, of the elites uh, in Gao. When they occupied, they often occupied uh, uh, offices associated with this land. Um, and those in the, in the Malian Empire would develop ties to the state. Without question, the Hajj of, of, um, of Mansa Musa represents a pinnacle of achievement both for both Mali and all of West Africa. He would return deeply affected, his association with the construction of many mosques emblematic of his connection to Islam's subsequent expansion. While in Cairo, uh, Mansa Musa openly de declared that he was of the Malachite school, quote unquote, underscoring an attempt to maintain political distance, if not independence, uh, from the Shafi'a uh, affiliated Mamluks while acknowledging uh, uh, the Maliki school's prior ascendance in West Africa. It was precisely this difference in, uh, in um, uh, the individual mother that allowed Musa, uh, Musa to inaugurate a process by which he would contribute to Islam's in, institutional, institutionalization while simultaneously strengthening Mali's claims to sovereignty, ac accomplishing both through a project of what I call indigenization. When Ibn Battuta visited the Malian capital, he met a number of expatriate uh, religious leaders, but he also met Abdul Rahman, a Qadi of Mali, and one of, and according to um, Ibn uh, Battuta, quote, one of the Sudan, a respectable pilgrim of noble virtues. This is rare praise for Ibn Battuta, but, but Abdul Rahman reflected uh, Mansa Musa's decision to adjust the profile of religious elites in Mali. Musa's experience in Egypt, where he had been pressured to swear allegiance, allegiance to the Mamluk ruler, was an opportunity to reconsider his dependence on foreign exp expertise. They may have been instrumental in his ascent, and, and they may have remained critical in diplomatic and commercial relations, but that very fact suggested a need to at least balance their influence. Political considerations were therefore as much a consideration in the formation of West African Muslim elites as the religious imperative itself. According to, to Tariq as Sudan, the jurist Khatib Musa was the last of the Sudanese imams uh, of Timbuktu's Jinjarebeer Mosque, holding the post for 40 years through both Malian and Tuareg rule. Blessed with ex exceptional health, Khatib Musa never missed a day nor delegated his authority much. And, and like Mansa Suleiman, sat on a who was a successor to Musa, sat on a dais to adjudicate cases beneath a large tree in a particular square, the Susu Debe Square. He was, uh, according to uh, one source, one of the ulama of the Sudan who traveled to Fez to study knowledge il, during Malian rule and by order of the just Sultan el Hajj Musa. <clears throat> Sending Black students to Fez was both the beginning and focus of Mansa Musa's indigenization program. And the aforementioned Malian Hadi who met with Ibn Battuta may, may have been one of the program's beneficiaries. As there's every evidence, the Mansa's initiative was wildly successful. 
Uh, such can be gleaned from Abdul Rahman's El Tamimi's relocating, sorry, Abdul Rahman at Tamimi's relocating to Timbuktu at a time when the city was completely overtaken by Sudanese fuqaha, that is jurists. Impressed with the city's level, uh, the city's level of scholarship and realizing that the quote unquote Sudanese scholars surpassed him in the knowledge of fiqh, he himself traveled to Fez to study. Of particular relevance to Mansa Musa's new policy was the Qadi of Timbuktu, the Sheikh and, and Faqih, and, ho and holy friend of Wali uh, Abdul, 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 Ab, um, Abu Abdullah Mudibu Muhammad al Kabori, who settled in Timbuktu in the middle of the 15th century. Um, the contemporary of a number of scholars central in the discussion of Songhai, Mudibu Muhammad al Kabori is said to have achieved the highest level levels of, of, of knowledge, ilm, and righteousness, and was so elevated that at one point he guaranteed paradise to those giving alms of, of 1,000 mithkals of gold to assist the poor, only to be acknowledged, uh, so, sorry, only to be admonished, according to one source, only to be admonished to, quote, not obligate us again, unquote, in a dream. He served as the teacher of such luminaries as Omar ibn Muhammad Aki and the illustrious Sheikh Sidi Yahya at Tadalisi. Such was his spiritual standing that a scholar of far reaching influence from Marrakesh died from leprosy after criticizing Murabu Muhammad el Khabari, having made play on his name and calling him el Kafari or heathen. As his name su suggests, Murabu Muhammad come, came from a town of, of, of the, came from the town of Kabora. Um, located in Masina, upstream from Ja. Both uh, Kabura and Ja were Malian provinces. Um, those students assigned to Fez may have come from various Malian provinces. Mansa Musa seems to have targeted Kabura for his indigenization pro project. And I go more and more into this, uh, and we don't have time for it. Um, mm, Okay. In pursuing his strategy, Mansa Musa demonstrated an awareness of the limits of military power and that he needed an alliance with state sponsored religious authorities that would liberate him from reliance on expatriates. His decision to educate, quote unquote, Sudanese scholars in Fez was therefore ambidextrous in promoting both Islam and the polity, creating excuse me, and, and interlacing not easily unraveled. In the same way, commissioning the construction of Jindu Reber Mosque in Timbuktu certainly elevated the profile of Islam, but the very fact that it was built at the command of the Mansa enhanced his own political authority as well. Mansa Musa's investment in Timbuktu helps to explain its continuing economic prosperity and the relocation of Sudanese ulama there. So I'm making the argument that it's with Mansa Musa that Timbuktu, he is the one who lays the foundation for the emergence of Timbuktu as a city of erudition. All right, I'm, uh, and so I'm pursuing this here. Um, In adhering to in, in adhering too closely to the chronicles characterizations of relations between Gao, Timbuktu, and Jinni, scholars have exaggerated the center's autonomy while granting them a measure of political clout uh, they did not actually wield. But this is not to say that religious elites did not exercise extraordinary influence. They certainly did. Rulers, righteous rulers like Askil Edge Muhammad. So this is subsequent. Um, this is subsequent, and here I'm moving into a discussion of. Um, oh, so so before you had a um, uh, a a photo of Jinjuri Bear. This uh, in Timbuktu. This is a um, photo of of the Sankore Mosque. I want to talk about that momentarily. But so what you have developing in Timbuktu are. Uh, uh, is the is the pursuit of scholarship which tends to cohere around specific types with uh, uh, around specific uh, mosques. I'll talk about that in a second there uh, momentarily. So 
uh, the religious religious elites certainly uh, uh, command a lot of 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 influence. Uh, righteous rulers like Askelaj Muhammad, who, as his, as his uh, title suggests, also made pilgrimage in the, uh, this would be in the 16th century, and he's the ruler of Imperial Songhai. Uh, uh, these rulers were acknowledged for the pursuit of Islam and respected as sovereigns, favored by God, but they were not necessarily holy men or scholars. On the other hand, the saints and scholars of Timbuktu, Jinni Ja, and so forth, other centers acquired substantial authority from two primary sources, erudition and piety. The two were intimately related as the former was often a factor in, in achieving the latter, involving an interaction between teacher and pupil that led to the persistent every, everyday application of what was learned. Erudition, however, could also be the result of such factors as family con connections and wealth, potential determinants in the quality, as well as the degree of knowledge. But in sum, spiritual authority derived from a command and performance of knowledge. Related to and complementing spiritual authority was a second dynamic, a power or force emanating from the spiritual plane and, best and bestowed by the Almighty, uh, this notion of baraka, which could be transmitted from person to person. Those possessing both spiritual authority and baraka commanded enormous respect. What therefore follows is informed by and pivots from the preceding discussion of political dim, dim, uh, dimensions of Timbuktu and Jinni, first examining the, the nature of spiritual authority derivative of scholarship, then pursuing a, a consideration of spiritual power of baraka and how concentrations of such authority and power formed a critical foundation for the ways in which Islam would unfold West Africa. So would unfold in West Africa. So here I am... Uh, Inferring, I am stating, uh, I am saying that what develops subsequently in West Africa, certainly by the time we move into the period of jihad or, West, uh, uh, or holy war in the 18th and 19th centuries, by which time Sufism is Islam in West Africa. The vast majority of Muslims in West Africa are Sufis, and they are adhering to either the Qadriya or the Tijaniya uh, 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 Tariqa and so, or brotherhood, and so this, this, this experience, this earlier experience in Timbuktu and Jinni and Ja and some of the other towns uh, represent, yeah, the, the foundation uh, for which flows subsequent um, uh, expressions of, of Islam, which, and those are the uh, expressions that are carried over into uh, the Americas. Reminiscing about Timbuktu's former glory, Tariq El Fatash, History of the Seeker, paints the following uh, idyllic portrait. Before the arrival of the Moroccan ordeal, in the Arabic is, for, is referred to as a fitna, and prior to the exile of the, of the children, grandchildren, and relatives of uh, Qadi Muhammad ibn Omar, who was a, a very important that these were very, this was a very important leading family in Timbuktu. Timbuktu had reached the height of loveliness, beauty, and elevation in religion and the Sunnah, lacking nothing in religion or material goods. At that time, Timbuktu had no equal throughout the territories of the land of the Blacks, from the, from the land of Mali to the farthest limits of the land of the West, with respect to virtue, freedom, uriya, purity, security, and protection throughout the land, mercy and compassion for the poor and strangers, and friendliness and assistance to the students of Islam, of, of knowledge. Though nostalgic, there is a substantive core uh, to the Tariq's recollection that finds an echo in Leo Africanus's description of Timbuktu, in which were, he says, quote, numerous judges, scholars, and priests, all well paid by the king, many manuscript books coming from Barbary are sold. Such sales are more profitable than any other goods, unquote. Leo Africanus's focus on scholars and books is in fact the substance of Tariq el Fatash's lament of a former Timbuktu in its heyday, a prime reason for the captivation with, Jin, with Timbuktu and Jinni throughout the centuries. Tariq el Fatash makes this very clear, transitioning from the general to the particular and estimating between 150 to 180 Quranic schools Maktaban 
in the city with one instructor, Muellem, receiving um, over 1,700 calories in payment every Wednesday, his students paying between five and 10 calories each, average, averaging just under 250 pupils in one school. By extension, this suggests a, a city with a sizable student population entirely consistent with Africanus's general assumption. Attempts at quantification are simply that, but a range of 7,500 to 9,000 students in uh, uh, in such schools does not seem unreasonable. Not does not seem to be an unreasonable estimate. By these and other indices, Timbuktu and Jenny emerge as vibrant centers of, of culture and commerce. And so here uh, is a representation of the subsequent imperial formation of Songhai. That is to say, subsequent to to Mali. And uh, uh, we can locate uh, the center here is Gao once again, Timbuktu once again, this node to the west and Gao to the east. Um, and you can see that there's a retraction, a movement away uh, from the Atlantic. I uh, remember Mali encompass went when uh, uh, Malian authority went out reached all the way to to the Atlantic Ocean Imperial Mali moves away from that and is more um focused uh on the on uh, on um uh relations to the north in Omegrib and you can see this uh, represented and also to the east moving more toward uh the Lake Chad region which is another where it runs into conflict uh with the city states of Hausa who are also competing with uh, with Songhai for control. This area here, yeah, this is not an area that I talk about uh, in African Dominion, but this is an area that dis that that merits uh, uh, a lot of study. We don't have sufficient studies, at least in English, uh, on this area, but this is the Lake Chad area. This is what is now uh, to the west, uh, northern Nigeria, uh, to the east, um, uh, Niger, Chad, and so forth. And uh, this is a, this is also an, an area very old in Islam, uh, centering on the states of of Kanem Bornu. This is the area which has extensive relations uh, with uh, North Africa, uh, and even more so, uh, it's even more tightly knitted to North Africa than than is uh, are the reaches further west in 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 uh, West Africa. And um, so we can we can talk about that uh, because it has implications to the even to the current day with respect to um, activity and uh, uh, and commodities and also the flow of ideas uh, which flow uh, uh, from uh, from Lake Chad straight into North Africa. All right. I should also say that that what's interesting about towns like Timbuktu and Jinni uh, is the fact that because of the materiality of, of, the, of the towns, that is to say, because commerce reaches uh, the place where, where the town or city could accommodate um, a number of scholars, yeah, in these places, it, what, what Timbuktu and Jinni are able to achieve is um uh a transition from uh from a tradition in West Africa in which the student would travel from scholar to scholar and that could be and those scholars could be located um uh, uh at tremendous different distances from one another and so the student who is committed to uh, achieving erudition would go to one town to study under a particular scholar. And when he, when he, and it's usually a he, very, very rarely a she, uh, completes studies with that scholar, then would move on to the next sheikh uh, in another town elsewhere in West Africa. And so, you know, this, these, these, these journeys could be very, uh, could be highly peripatetic. It could take years and years and years just to make uh, the circumlocutions in order to achieve a particular level of erudition in a particular uh, Muslim science. Yeah, so, but what Timbuktu and Jenny is they are able to do is to bring these scholars into one locale. And so the student could stay uh, in Jenny or stay in Timbuktu and study any number of, of, of topics, uh, any number of fields. 
Um, <clears throat> a rich and engaging literature has developed within recent years that, uh, that in multiple, and so this is, uh, I wanna just give you a sense. This is um, a 19th century, I think this might be Bar uh, 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 Barth's uh, rendition of Timbuktu. In the background is Ginger Ray Bear uh, Mosque. And I uh, just wanna give you a sense of of the of the uh, patrimony of the area, these are just these are some manuscripts uh, in um, you know in a container, um, and this you, this <laughs> this experience you could replicate all over West Africa, uh, but in particular in Mali, mm. and I, and 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 when I was there uh, doing what I needed to do uh, before the time of troubles, more recent time of troubles. Uh, I could go out to any number of towns or, or villages and and uh, meet the imam, sit down, have a conversation. If we hit it off, uh, he may be willing to uh, uh, show me his treasure. Yeah. And these and so this is this was all over West Africa. And I would maintain that uh, I mean, there have been people who have tried to estimate the number of manuscripts in West Africa. Uh, I'm puzzled as to how they know that because because uh, um, uh, the area is replete, and uh, many of these manuscripts, by the way, were hidden uh, as a consequence of the colonial um, of, the, of, the, of the colonial experience. A number of these manuscripts would be carted off into Europe, in particular into France. So, as a as a response to that, a number of these manuscripts were hidden, buried. Uh, stowed away so that colonial uh, authorities could not access them. Uh, it was only in more recent times, mm, from the 1970s on, that a number of these families and these these documents tend to be owned by families as opposed to individuals. Families would be willing, if you will, to uh, either let their treasures be known or to even share those treasures um, uh, with the world. And so, um, you know, here is uh, just just you could see that this is um, an example of 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 a, of a page of writing that comes from uh, from the collection. This is Maghribi script. You see here also this is uh, um, a, a, a part of a Quran that was bought in a very early period in time, twelve twenty three in Fez, uh, wound up in West Africa. I made reference to the trade in books, which was a, a very lively trade uh, in West Africa. We can talk about this. As a matter of fact, what I want to do at some point is to talk about, and we need to have more scholarship on what happens after the Moroccan invasion, because the Moroccans will come down in the Songhai and destroy the and, and destroy the, Mar uh, the the Songhai Empire. They will take a number of people into exile. They will so they're going there because they want to directly access the gold trade. Uh, and control the gold trade because because Morocco was in this fight uh, uh, with um, you know what becomes Portugal and Spain over over the control of Iberia it needs resources all right so uh, yes so uh, but when the Moroccans defeat Songhai and they return to and they return to um, Marrakesh, uh, the, um, what we don't know about sufficiently are the books that they take back. There are a number of books that are taken back to Morocco. And some of those books remain in Mor Morocco. Some of them were transferred into Iberia. It's an interesting, interesting story, but the, the collective library of Timbuktu is raided uh, during this period of time. So uh, that we need much more of that. Okay, I, so let me just, um, let me go back and I can go back. So I think I'm running out of time. Um, Daniel, I had a whole lot to say. Let's see if I can wrap this up uh, within the next uh, couple of minutes and then we can we can have a conversation. Uh, the scholarship that emerges out of Timbuktu and Jinni uh, can um, uh, be placed into four categories or four things. Curricula, 
through which erudition committed itself to a broader Muslim world of letters, levels of scholarship, the relationship between teacher and pupil, and ensuing chains of transmission over generations, and the financial support of scholars. Um, I, I have developed a discussion of these four areas. I don't know that we'll be able to do this, but uh, there is a fifth theme or fifth area uh, to which we could um, shift, and perhaps we could do that in the Q the Q and A. And this is the metaphysical dimension of the scholarly scholarly community, as it provided a basis for the growth and expansion of esoteric practice, including Sufism, uh, throughout West Africa and subsequent uh, generations. Uh, to characterize the pursuit of Islamic studies. As curricula is to adopt an idiom often associated with with a with a university, or circumstance of advanced study, and indeed learning in Timbuktu has has been characterized as something similar, with the quote unquote University of Sankore as its uh, core, while somewhat problematic in its conjuring of Western institutions, with which circumstances in Timbuktu are then compared. Advanced study existed in many parts of the world, including or especially the Dar al Islam, and the latter is the better frame of reference for understanding Timbuktu and Jenny as cultural centers. The notion of a university of Sankore, there, uh, however, is not inconsistent with spheres of influence and prestige within Timbuktu, as much of its cultural activity revolved around the mosques of Jinjari uh, Bear, Sankore, and Sidi Yaya. To be sure, there were other city mosques. Uh, including uh, that of the main uh, market or, or souk, uh, the Ali ibn Yusuf, uh, the, the, uh, the Ali ibn Yusuf mosque and the mosque of the Tuatis, uh, but the three that I mentioned are the main ones. Yeah, uh, let's see if I can just uh, kind of sum this up. Uh, mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. Mm. Let's see. Mm. Relative to Sidi Yahya in Jinjari Bear, Sankore Mas clearly emerges in the writings of uh, of, the, uh, of many of the sources as the very heart of the pursuit of Islamic sciences in Timbuktu, translated, translated to possibly mean white nobility, quote unquote, in a fashion similar to the Arabic by Dan, and therefore as complicated as the Sanhaja community with uh, was multi-phenotypical. Sankore, Sankore quarter was located to, in the Northeast of Timbuktu, where its mosque was built uh, at an unknown date by a single very wealthy woman, uh, Sankore became an enclave for Sanhaja immigrants from Wallata in the early 15th century. Um, other immigrants were Muhammad Akis, uh, Sidi Abdurrahman, uh, Mudibu Muhammad al Kabari, uh, uh, Abdu, um, Abu Abdullah uh, Andaag, Muhammad the Elder, and so forth. Uh, these men built upon a foundation laid by Fez trained scholars during the Malian period becoming the progenitors of successive generations of highly educated religious elites, the atmosphere created uh, by these first and second generation immigrate, immigrant, immigrants were so exceptional uh, that uh, Mudibu Muhammad el Kabari would make the boldest of comparisons. Quote, I was the contemporary of the righteous people of Sankore who were equaled in their righteousness only by the companions of the, of the messenger of God. May God bless him and grant him peace and may he be pleased with them all. Uh, it is therefore with activity, and I will end on this note, Daniel, uh, but I'll just go through this very quickly. It is therefore with activity in Sankore quarter that the contours of high erudition take form, and as the secondary literature has well established, the basis for of the Islamic sciences uh, was the Quran and its exegesis or tafsir, followed by the study of hadith or traditions of the Prophet via the Sahih of Muslim and Sahih of El Bukhari, along with such interpretive works as Kitab al Shifa of Qadi Iyad. Following the Hadith was the study of jurisprudence or fiqh. And given that uh, Songhai, Imperial Songhai, and most of West and North Africa adhered to the Maliki mother, it was informed by the Mawata of Malik ibn Anas, uh, the Mudawana of, of, of Sahnun, uh, and its abridgment. Uh, the Tahdib 
uh, of El uh, Baradi, uh, the Risala of Ibn I, of Ibn Abizaid, Ibn Ibn Abizaid, the Muqtasar of the Egyptian uh, Khalil uh, Ibn Ishaq El Jundi, Wakala Wakala. In addition to these disciplines, Arabic grammar, Nahwa, and syntax and rhetoric and logic were also studied, as all as were astronomy uh, and medicine. Uh, astronomy, of course, being important for because this is a lunar-based culture uh, engaged in extensive uh, cross-regional travel. History was not formally studied, uh, viewed from the Islamic pr perspective of the time as quote-unquote worldly, if it did not pertain to the early Muslim Ummah, or was or as the preserve of the griots in the indigenous uh, context. Sufism as an intellectual field, interestingly, is poorly represented. Uh, and this is remarkable since it was becoming an important, if not critical, aspect of, of Muslim life in uh, San Kore. Studying the various branches of Islam began with Quranic school or, or maktab, where students um, learned Arabic grammar and the Quranic recitation. Though the sources from the period do not specify, but if similar to later uh, Quranic schools in West Africa, boys and girls would learn in separate spaces with boys of sufficient means continuing their education beyond a certain level. In later centuries, the, the term madrasa would become more commonly used for the same school and early process. But, but for the period in question, madras, madrasa seems, the term madrasa seems to have been reserved for schools led by individuals with the capacity of more advanced study and was used interchangeably with the term majlis in this context, meaning uh, t teaching circle. The latter is also employed for the study of specific books or in conjunction with a prominent teacher. It suggested very focused, suggesting very focused, intense learning on the part of well-educated individuals. Uh, the physical uh, setting of the maktab, madrasa, or majlis uh, was in or near a mosque or home of the instructor. And examples of the pedagogic process, process include those of certain individuals. And um, basically, uh, so we, we don't have time to get into this, but uh, with the successful completion of a book, the instructor would provide the, the student with a nijaza, uh, a license qualifying the person to teach the same, and it goes on and on. And so this connects, therefore, with what happens in, to, to bring a, a conclusion to this. This connects, therefore, with some of the writings that um, developed subsequently that are, have been recovered in North America and Brazil in the Caribbean and so forth, which events familiarity uh, with fiqh, with events, uh, for, certainly familiarity with the Quran, which that is to say, which events study. So, so, so these West African Muslims are coming and they are bringing uh, a legacy of learning. They don't, they're not all well educated. Yeah, I'm not making that point, but some of them are, are well educated and they come into the Americas, they bring their legacy of learning. In some instances, they attempt to practice, uh, you know, uh, uh, their principles and uh, they meet with, you know, varying levels of success. Yeah. And so, uh, so that's the point that I would like to make this afternoon. Okay, that is to say that you just simply can't look at the specific um, uh, socio-political context out of which people are emerging and going into the into the into, into the Americas in the 18th and 19th centuries. Those contexts are in turn predicated upon this earlier uh, uh, substratum, if you will, um, uh, of an earlier iteration iteration of Islam which people carry. There's an ongoing understanding that they carry the legacy of what uh, initially develops uh, in Imperial Mali. Thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Gomez and invite everyone listening to offer a sort of virtual round of applause. If we were in person, we would... Uh, certainly be doing so. Uh, this is this is tremendous. I have uh, many questions myself, but uh, I am the moderator here, and I, I've invited several scholars who are here with us for their reflections on your talk, as well as questions that they may have about this very rich history you have opened. 
uh, most interesting to me uh, being the Mansa Musa narrative and the way in which this individual indigenized Islam throughout this region um, itself a fascinating story worthy of a uh, film uh, unto itself. Uh, perhaps there there may be one, I'm not sure. I want to invite um, uh, Mukhtar Diallo, uh, if he is uh, with us, I who actually is uh, currently in the region that we were just looking at these maps uh, uh, to 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 say something. I want to invite Patrick Bowen. Uh, Susan had to leave, but there are others too. Uh, yeah. I see Mukhtar. Perhaps you might wish to jump in if you're free. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Danielle, for first the opportunity to to participate to this uh, amazing symposium. And thank you, Professor Gomez, for your very enlightening and very rich presentation. Um, in a way, for me to listen to it is a, is, is amazing uh, to see you breaking silences. And I'm saying breaking silences because a lot of people don't have uh, the slightest idea of multiple faces of Islam in West Africa, the level of sophistication you get in the, in these different reiteration or reifications or in into endogenous processes that have been ongoing long before we got here. So I really appreciate appreciate that. The second thing I wanted to say is uh, I am one of those people that carry those legacy because I'm I'm currently talking to you from Guinea, and I'm a Tijani. From my mom's side, I gather here from my dad, from my father's side. So I absolutely understand uh, what you are talking about. In addition to the fact that uh, I have a background in anthropology and international relations, and I'm interested in political ethnography, and some of my training went on in Cairo and South Africa at its university. So thank you, thank you for uh, putting a spotlight on these facets that facets are very important in understanding the complexities of what constitute Islam in West Africa and uh, in, in relation to what constitute eventually the different pathways by which Islam came to the United States. So thank you for that. So um, I have two, com two things that I wanted to make, two points. The first is just a small comment, and the second uh, is probably to uh, to to ask you a simple question in terms of some of the things that you just mentioned. So the first point is like uh, I was very impressed that uh, you showed those maps because those maps are very important. They the, the pre-colonial maps, uh, not so they are very important to show what's going on in West Africa prior to the European um, period of contact, the eventual colonialists. Because but they're also important because who made them? They were made by the French, by the French mostly. And those cards, that's, that's a very, very important factor to keep in mind because I think um, prior to the arrival of colon uh, European colonial powers, uh, the endogenous forces in terms of state building processes were dominated by these different caliphates, the Futa Toro, the Futa Jalon, the Sokoto, the Masina, the Adamawa, et cetera, et cetera. They constituted an island of state making. They're working on consolidating themselves in different type of imperial entities within West Africa. So that's very important because they are also linked to what I call the river ecosystem that separated the Sahara to the southern part of Africa, which is the Senegal River, the Gambia River, the Niger River, the Shari, the Baria, and the Nile River. All those rivers constitute, constitute a big barrier that um, separated the expansion of Islam and the indigenous political process that exists, the indigenous as in that tend to be uh, referred to as traditional African entities, social political entities that were being developed. So that I think that's a very important point. Also, if you keep in mind the fact that one of the things that, that stop a little bit the expansion of Islam is the state they fly. The state they fly a diminish of value of the technology of using horses in the expansion of Islam throughout the South, which create a different type of spaces. So I, I think I wanted to make those comments uh, to up in terms of appreciating you showing the visual, um, uh, those visual map to facilitate our understanding and, uh, and uh, your, your presentation. The second thing I wanted to talk about is Mansa Musa. I think uh, maybe you can then maybe answer is this comment that says them is an inquiry because uh, Mansa Musa's trip to, to Mecca is uh, very important as is, it shows the ascendancy of Mali Empire eventually, but also it's the beginning of its decline. 
because the social political economy built around the particular trip went beyond Africa and the Middle East. It went towards Europe, which became the impetus for the Portuguese to eventually look for other routes and uh, develop what we call the port system along the west coast of Africa. And to me, the port system is uh, similar to the mosque, mosque system that were built around the Niger buckles. They, they represented platform of access point and extraction at the same time. So the Islamic process of expansion using the mosque to control the trade routes and the production of gold and access to certain commodities is the same thing that the French and the, Portu and the Portuguese first and then the French later used along the coast of West Africa to transform what I call the north-south axis and the, into the west, into the, the east-west axis into the north-south axis, which is the trade routes, breaking, dislocating trade, trade hubs and nodes to, to, in order to control these new centers of powers in the making throughout, through the colonial project. So I don't know what you think of that kind of approach in understanding the social political dynamic and the political economies fighting within the space of West Africa. Uh, well, uh, Ustad Jalla. Ustad Jallo. Ustad Musa Bukta Jallo, yes. Ah, uh -huh. Jamwali. Yeah, Jaram. Mbawali uh, Jam. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, it's a very astute observation, uh, Professor Jallo. Um, I like the analysis because so a couple of things I want to say, and I, because I know other people want to want uh, to, to to say some things. Um, when we look at the Omarian state, when we look at Masina, when we look at the Sokote, so, uh, the Sokoto Caliphate, and so forth, the soil, what we're looking at in West Africa is the emergence of West African polity according to a West African imagination. That, ima that political imagination is cut off with the colonial experience. And it is replaced by a notion by, by something that West Africa or East Africa has never fully been able to recover. That is to say, with the on with the with the with the uh, onset of the colonial experience, the the entire continent, but in particular in West and East Africa, where Islam has been had been prominent, the concept of polity is redirected toward the Westphalian notion. And in my humble opinion, in my humble opinion, the region has suffered ever since because, because the West African political imagination has not been allowed to, to live, to breathe, to, to, to exist, to, 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 to define itself and, def and to define, you know, what life should be like for West Africans. And so consequently, you know the 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 region and in, and indeed the entire continent has been wrestling with uh, this imposition and you know arguably it hasn't been going so well. All right. So going back to Mansa Musa, this is very astute. Yes, because in making Hajj, he brings attention. He brings attention. You remember when he brings all of this gold. It's the it's the it's the it's the Egyptian chronicles. It's the chronicles developed in Misr that state. This man brought so much gold into this place that the value of gold went down and remained devalued for years. It was so they could not believe how much gold was was being transported right into 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 this area. In addition to the thousands, thousands, I mean, you know, anywhere from 20 to 60,000 West Africans, can you imagine coming into Egypt along with Mansa Musa? It was, it was, it was a, it was a level of theater. I'm not sure the world has ever seen, certainly hadn't seen it by that at, at that point in time, but it brought attention. And this, this map. <laughs> This this map developed in Mallorca is a is just emblematic of the attention that it brought. Yes. And yes, it does connect with uh this moment in which the Portuguese 
are beginning to, you know, say, you know, we want, uh, we want to directly tap the source of gold. We want to directly tap what's coming out of the Indian Ocean and so forth and so on. So, but I think also what need what we need to consider, uh, Professor Jallo, is the timing of Mansa Musa's pilgrimage because he is he he enters into Egypt. So the Mamluks are the foremost Sunni power in the world. So it makes sense for him to go to al Qahira and, and, and engage with the Mamluk ruler. And he goes there and he essentially says, I am a peer. I am a peer. Now, the Mamluk ruler does not accept that, but he, he treats them very well. He treats them very well. The problem with his with the timing is that he goes into Egypt at a time when the military uh, techniques, okay, that the Malians deploy and the Mamluks deploy are not terribly dissimilar. They have some techniques, some strategies that are different, but the um, the technological basis for the military is very, very similar. What I'm saying is, this is a roundabout way to say that Mansa, Man, uh, Mansa Musa's pilgrimage takes place about 50 to 100 years too soon. Because this is, because it's after, it's subsequent to, to the pilgrimage that gunpowder weapons emerge. And this is not something to which Musa, nor Mansa Suleiman, or others who follow him have access. They don't have access to gunpowder uh, weapons. And those gunpowder weapons make all the difference. I want to turn now to Patrick Bowen um, for his comments. And I want to thank Mukhtar for such a brilliant uh, exchange. I really. And we all benefited from that. Uh, Patrick, we have, I think, I don't know, how much time do you have, uh, Dr. Gomez, with us right now? Uh, maybe minutes. about 10 more minutes. All right, great. So, Patrick, take it away. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for the, the very interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Gomez. And uh, I did want to uh, focus on the uh, experience in the Americas and how this relates to that with my question. But uh, I think Professor Jallo's um, point about your demonstrating the sophistication, complexity, and the deep integration of the uh, Sankore uh, knowledge throughout West Africa and Islam in West Africa uh, was very important and i think what stood out most was your use of the term replete with manuscripts all around west africa uh and also the uh you're stating that um west african islam is tijani is kadiri and uh that really helps put things in the contest and it shifts it shifts the view of how we think about uh islam uh and it's contact with the Americas. But um, I want to turn real quick to uh, some comments you made right at the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, and this will lead to my question. You mentioned that the uh, Mali Empire left a powerful mark on the West African imagination. And its grandeur, um, the ideas about it, uh, that it was iconic, that's the word you used, uh, and that this persisted in the West African understanding of who they were. Um, now, one of my favorite works of yours is, of course, I know Black Crescent, but after reading Black Crescent, I went back and read Exchanging Our Country Marks, and it discusses the uh, transmission of folk knowledge and folk practices and how those trans transformed and were exchanged, as the title says, and shaped the concept of 
identity in the Americas. And given that you are stressing here today the power of the um, memory of the Mali Empire uh, spread throughout the West African identity, uh, and I know you did mention the manuscripts uh, that we have evidence of education, specifically highly educated people who have come to the Americas. But what about the more folk uh, elements of folk imagination? How did that impact? And have you thought about revisiting uh, these themes that you express in exchanging our country marks? It's a very good question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bowen, for um, that question. Ah, uh, I think that uh, here we're kind of entering into a kind of sticky wicket, if you will. And I want to, your question, what your question raises in my mind, mm, uh, and this is not what you intend, but let me lay it out for you um because i think that it uh may be of significance one of the one of the issues that certainly with the french colonial experience when the french uh, enter into North Africa, West Africa, and they begin to compare the ways in which Islam in West Africa is practiced with that in North Africa. They come up with a notion that they they come up with this notion of Islam noir, and 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 their view in their view the notion was that the way that Islam was practiced in West Africa was different and not quite of the quality that was practiced in El Maghrib. And there are various reasons for this. Um, uh, but in particular, these reasons re revolve around, for example, uh, the use of amulets or grigri and this type of thing. Amulets are definitely used in the Americas. Of that, there's no question. We, if you go to, um, if you go to Salvador in Bahia, and they allow you to go into the library, and you're able to access the archives that relate back to the 1835 Malay Revolt, I was shocked. They have the actual amulets that the archivist just simply embedded into the record. The actual material you can touch the actual you can actually touch the amulets in the revolt uh, in San Domingue that becomes Haiti. There are references. The Muslim presence is very, certainly not pronounced, but there are references in the various sources to the to the insurgents using uh, relying upon Muslim amulets. So that is something that we could certainly do more to explore. Yeah, we could do more to explore. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, possibly we could explore more. I'm so, so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we could explore the ways in which culture engages with, with, uh, with religious practice and is unique to West Africa, if you will, um, or emblem, em, 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 emblematic of West Africa. We could do more with that. I agree with you there. Uh, perhaps in the way of dress, although the problem here, of course, is that, you know, these enslaved people did not have control necessarily of, you know, uh, the, you know, how they could dress and so forth. Diet is something that perhaps we could explore a little better. Yeah, diet is something that perhaps we could explore a little better. Uh, but I want to go back to 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 this because I think that there are a number of different 
uh, aspects of culture that both Muslims and non-Muslims participated in in West Africa. And this amulet business is part of that. Well, this is a big controversy, you know, because, you know, now uh, uh, Dr. Jallo is in the region. He's more aware of this than I am. Yeah. But, you know, with the rise of Salafism, this is a this has become a problem. This has become an issue. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how it's going to work out. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's a it's a source of tremendous controversy and only growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. The whole uh, um, if I come in, the whole uh, struggle going on around what we call the Sahara Corridor is actually those centrifugal forces coming back into modern time and to re actually reclaim on part to reclaim exactly those postures, the status of the process of making new praxis. I, I want to jump in to respect Dr. Gomez's time. We are a little bit over time. Okay. Uh, we are feeling as if we're just getting started. The good news is Professor Gomez will be offering a talk sometime in the future as part of American Muslim Pathways. This talk today was actually the in, in, in initial, the first talk, and I think it could not have been a a better choice uh, than what you've chosen to to spotlight for us. Um, it really is a sort of springboard uh, for much, much more interventions that our scholars are going to embark upon in the next year. We are planning uh, 10 flagship lectures around the country at PBS stations in partnership with academic groups and community groups. Uh, very honored that Dr. Gomez shared these insights, these maps, these visuals. This presentation will live on YouTube so that people can benefit from learning about this forgotten history. And I want to invite everyone to once again give a virtual round of applause to our keynote, uh, Dr. Mike Gomez. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the, for the invitation. Thank you for the interaction. And um... Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are on the planet. Thank you. Okay. Feel free to hop off and thank you again. And folks, we will be in touch uh, on everything, on follow-ups, and we look forward to having you host one of these events. Thank you for your time today. Uh, Nosheen and myself will be in touch. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank, you. thank you all. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.